Uh, it's David Burroughs from Barometer. I thought tonight it might be useful to have a quick uh, review and update as to what we've been doing over the last three weeks while the world has been focused on this coronavirus. It clearly has been a very difficult three weeks. Uh, lots going on in the world, people very concerned about health and their families and their loved ones. Uh, but at the same time, we've been bombarded with information about what's going on in the market uh, and in the economy. And uh, this is our part. We have been absolutely focused day to day on portfolios uh, and trying to understand and manage our way through what has been a very difficult time. And I'm pleased to say that through this period, we've been able to manage volatility uh, fairly well uh, and the portfolios are in pretty good shape. Um, just to start off, you know, uh, we have talked for some time about the fact that our belief was we were in a secular or long-term bull market for stocks, uh, much like the 1980s and 90s and much like the 50s and 60s. Uh, but despite the fact that long-term bull markets are, are very constructive, uh, there are some big interruptions. Uh, and in particular, we'll remember the 1987 crash. Uh, there was some significant major corrections in the 1960s uh, and this is this is what can happen in markets and it's why we we really believe in being tactical and picking our spots uh, and and making active decisions about how exposed we should be as we move through the course of a four or five year cycle and now uh, in good times of course our job is to find those things that um, are performing well try to identify the leadership themes, things that are being revalued, uh, and try and take advantage of them. We don't try to be everywhere. We do try to pick our spots. Uh, we really have to be focused on recognizing change when old leadership recedes and, and new leadership emerges. And of course, most important, we have to be able to identify those times where we have to play some defense. And very clearly, the last three weeks have been one of those periods. Uh, we sent out two major commentaries over the piece. The first one was in the middle of February uh, discussing the beginning of this sell-off and that we would follow our process step by step. As you know, we use stop losses on our positions. And when our market work points to uh, less constructive environments, uh, we stop putting on new positions and our job is to, is to protect the, the portfolio. So we have been quite tactical over the last few weeks. Uh, and in are in a position which is very flexible uh, to move forward. So uh, the bad news, the bad news is the S&P 500 sold off 34% over 23 days. It just happens to be the fastest and deepest waterfall decline or crash in, in history. Uh, it's not very comforting. Uh, however, uh, there are things we can take away from what happens in a waterfall decline. And if we manage it properly, we wind up having an opportunity to take advantage of one of those generational opportunities to build portfolios uh, and take advantage of things coming out the other side. So to put it in context, this is the S&P 500 back to 1990. And this is the decline that we've just been through. And in fact, it's interesting because if you take, draw a trend line from the beginning of the bull market in 2013, after we exited 13 years of difficult markets, we touched down on this trend line in 2016, and we touched down again on it a week ago, and we maintained that long-term trend residing just above there as we speak. So a very difficult sell-off. We still remain in a secular bull market for stocks at this point, um, but certainly, you know, decisions have to be made as we go along. If we take a look at the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ has been in a long-term bullish trend since 2008 uh, and pulled right back into the support uh, as of a week ago. Uh, and at the beginning of uh, last week, we sent out a, a discussion piece that talked about how markets go through market bottoms what we would need to look for, what our expectations were going forward. And we said we looked as though we were starting into sort of a bottoming process that would take some period of weeks, but ultimately we probably were seeing the major lows. So um, these are the things we need to see 
to feel that we have put in a significant, at least near term low for the market, uh, which then gives us opportunity on the other side. A week ago, we said we felt that risks were, were by then balanced. There was upside risk where the market could rally sharply or downside risk where the market could sell off. And our job was to be balanced. We were roughly 50% invested in stocks and roughly 50% invested in cash and short-term bonds, giving us protection against further decline. If we had moved lower, we would continue to stop our way out of positions. Uh, and if we move higher and put in a low, it gives us an opportunity to begin rebuilding. So these are the eight things that we need to see to feel like we're going through a significant testable low. Uh, we needed to see extreme oversold conditions. We needed to see very negative, uh, almost panicked sentiment. We needed to start to see a reduction in the number of stocks making new lows, even while markets were making new lows. That's a divergence that we look for. We needed to see correlations or the degree to which stocks behave the same start to fall, meaning the market was starting to sort the good from the bad. We needed to see some really strong breadth on up days, meaning lots of stocks going up and very few stocks going down. We needed to see the beginning of money flowing into sectors or themes that were more economically sensitive sort of higher risk rather than low risk defensive sectors where people go to hide. We needed to see credit markets start to show some improvement because obviously when you go through a major decline, the fear is that it turns into a financial crisis and forces a second leg of a decline. And we needed to see some improvement in the yield curve where long-term rates would be higher than short-term rates, which is a more normal yield curve. So let's go through these quickly. Extreme oversold conditions. As of uh, Friday, last Friday, we, the S&P 500 was trading close to 30% below its long-term moving average, its 200-day moving average. That has happened very rarely. It means it's deviated a long way from the long-term trend. It happened in the 2008 financial crisis. It happened at the end of the technology crash in 2003. It happened in the crash of 1987. It happened in the 1973-74 bear market. A small handful of times, we definitely met the test, have we seen extreme oversold conditions? Second test, did we see apocalyptic or panicked sentiment? Well, clearly there was a lot of panic in the market over the past few weeks. Uh, this healthcare crisis triggers our amygdala, the old part of the brain, which is all about survival. Uh, and it forced a lot of selling in the market. A lot of people said, I just have to step aside. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the number of people who are bullish, as of the beginning of last week, only 20% or just above 20% of investors bullish. The last time we saw that was during the financial crisis in 2008. And before that, the technology crash 2002. So extremely negative sentiment. Let's look at what happened as the market was making lows. As we started to get toward lows about a week ago, 68% of stocks in the S&P 500 were making new 52-week lows. Important to see as the market made a lower low this past Monday, actually only 19% of stocks went back and made lower lows. So that tells you that good stocks started to separate themselves from bad stock. The panic selling of everything started to dissipate. If we put that in a, in a, a historical uh, context, um, if you said, take all the days in history where the market was down significantly, how many stocks went down, how many stocks went up, the market down 4.3% and only one stock, 1.3 stocks down for every one stock up is a divergence. That is, that is what happens at market lows. The last time that happened was in 1953, as you retested the low of a bear market at a higher level. Only 1.3 to 1 stocks went down and a 4.5% decline. It was a bottom that kicked off a 20, 25% rally. Next test, are we seeing falling correlations or stocks starting to behave differently than one another? In a crisis, everything acts the same. Everything's for sale, good, bad, defensive, offensive, doesn't matter. But in the last number of days, we've started to see correlations at the stock level fall and correlations at the sector level fall. 
So just to give you an example, in 2008-9, as the market was going through its bottoming process, correlations started to fall, meaning the systemic issue started to become less important than the individual stock or individual sector issue. And some stocks started to do well, some stocks kept doing poorly, the market separated the good from the bad. We've just seen the beginning of that over the last three days. Now let's go to the other side. In the last couple of days, we've had very strong markets. On Tuesday, we had a 13 to one up day. In other words, 13 companies went up for every one company that went down. And the last time we saw that was at the end of the wreck in 2018, signaling the beginning of that rally that came out of the end of that year. If we take a look at it another way, 94% of the volume on Tuesday was up volume. Again, the last time we saw that was at the end of 2018. Before that, the end of the, the, the sell-off in 2016. Next on the list, do we see emergence of risk-seeking leadership? Investors being prepared to take risk, feeling that the discount that's been built into share prices is, is taking into account the risks that we may go through over the next few months. Since the 10th of March, we have seen banks outperform real estate investment trusts, economically sensitive versus defensive. Since the 17th, we saw high beta or economically sensitive companies outperform low beta, low vol. We started to see consumer discretionary stocks outperform consumer staples. And if we were to plot the last two days, that has continued and accelerated. So just to use an example, transports, which of course get hurt going through the kind of shutdown that we're seeing, have started to rally, gave their first buy signal on a point and figure chart, strong relative performance in the last few days. Semiconductors, highly economically sensitive. Nobody wants to hold these in inventory, uh, but they go into everything. Good indication of what people are thinking future wise from an economic perspective. Semiconductors giving their first two buy signals, moving higher. And in fact, from a relative strength standpoint, I've just made a new relative high versus the S&P 500, meaning performing better than at any time in history versus the stock market itself. That is risk-seeking leadership. We need to see credit markets get better. In other words, the yields that investors demand for buying a corporate bond versus a government bond, the spread should start to come in or be reduced, which means people are more comfortable with credit risk. In the last week, we have seen unprecedented monetary stimulus, and we've also seen unprecedented fiscal stimulus. In previous waterfall declines and serious economic problems, where we got a second leg of a decline came when the government or the Fed did not act quickly and we wound up with a credit problem. So of course, the famous one is in the early 1930s when the market crashed, the government did nothing. They took a laissez-faire attitude. Home prices started to fall. That was the collateral for the banks. The banks started to fail and you wound up with a depression. This is exactly what the Fed and the US government is trying to make sure does not happen. And credit markets are responding, spreads are coming down and they've continued over the last two days. Now, when people expect future difficulty in the market, then measures of what people will pay for volatility go up. When we start to believe that things could be getting better, even while markets continue to fall, you wanna see volatility measures start to fall. That's called a divergence again. So this is what we've seen over the last five days. In the last week, while the market chopped around trying to find a bottom, volatility started to dissipate in the market. Now, why, why is volatility a big deal? Well, when we've had a break in the market like we've had over the last three weeks, there was new information introduced to investors who had to take that information and decide what that meant for the economy and therefore what it meant for the market one month, three months, six months, 12 months from now. And it introduced tremendous uncertainty. So the wide swings in percentage points that the market was going through was the market trying to find a clearing price, a meeting point between buyers and sellers where that negative new news was priced into the market. 
And this is what we started to see over the last week, the market starting to get comfortable with the fact that the discount in prices has taken into account some of the worst case scenarios for the market going forward. Now we know that this is a, an issue that will last a finite period of time. And so the market has to look across that valley and say, what will it take for things to get better? And we're starting to see those things. So if you looked at it, if you went back through history all days since 1950, and you compared what happened to the stock market when prices went down, what happened to volatility? This is a true outlier. On Tuesday of this week, stock market, sorry, on Monday of this week, the market went down 4.3%, but volatility fell over 6%. That's a really unusual thing for stocks to go down a lot, but volatility to fall. So that, again, is one of those signs of a market bottom. And of course, we saw a very significant fall of volatility from 85 all the way down to 38. That means people are expecting much less volatility going forward. So let's look at our tools. As you know, we like to look at the market and say, if you gave every security a single vote, what percent of securities are performing well? knowing that at market tops, a high percentage of securities will be doing well. And when markets go through sell-offs, eventually almost nothing is doing well. We want to know when the strong stocks start to improve. And what we've seen over the last week is for all stocks in the U.S., we bottomed at only 8% performing constructively. That lines up with what happened in 2008. It lines up with what happened in 2000, uh, sorry, 1974 bear market. That is bad as it, as it has ever been. We've seen significant improvements over the last week for all stocks in the U.S., um, uh, breadth for NYSE stocks, breadth for the NASDAQ has turned higher. And in fact, if we look at all major markets around the world, all of these countries in green have had their breadth models turn higher, which is a contrarian sign money is starting to get put to work. The strong stocks are starting to perform well. If we take it sector by sector, a week ago, all of the sectors in the market had between zero and 20% of stocks performing well. Today, we've seen a number of sectors turn higher and their bread start to improve. Money's getting put to work. So let's try and quantify this a little bit. We've gone through a waterfall or a crash event. The last crash event that the market went through was 1987. So the market just recently sold off 33% over 21 trading days. In 1987, it sold off 35% over 41 trading days. Now what drives crashes is a combination of things that can be different every time. But when investors go through a crash, they behave the same way over and over and over again. We are driven by fear and greed. A crash is driven by fear. And when people go through a panic, they behave the same over and over again. So here's what happened in 1987. When the market made its low, in the next two days, it had a very, very sharp rally, much like we've seen over the last few days. If you went out from that date, after a very sharp rally, the market then chopped in a wide range for the next six weeks until year end 1987. Market rallied, it fell, it rallied, it fell. It tried to come to grips with what had just happened and what the impact might be going forward. Now the 87 crash happened in a secular bull market. It happened during a pretty strong economy. It happened when consumer confidence going in was quite strong. And when things came out, after that six weeks, the market rallied 63% over the next 102 weeks. So there's a reason why once you get to the lows, you don't keep pushing stocks over the transom because things get overdone. If we went back to another famous example and look at um, 1929, that was also a waterfall event. It was also a crash. It was also devastating. People panicked. And then what happened? Despite the fact what happened later on in the economy, the market actually rallied for six full months following the crash. Now, in 1987, 
in the first bounce, it recovered a third of the decline before it retested the lows. In 1929, it recovered 50% of the decline, but it did some testing along the way. Bottoming took time. If we look at where we are today, the market fell 34% over 22 days. We have since had three solid days of rally. The market has rallied almost a third of what it gave up. Now, when we wrote our piece last week, we said, look, we will have a sharp bounce. The conditions are setting up for a market bottom. We are not going to push a lot of money into the market because bottoms take time to evolve after the kind of decline that we've seen. So we would expect, like 1987, that markets are likely to remain volatile for the foreseeable future. A week ago, we said we are 50% cash and bonds, roughly 50% invested in securities that have held up well through the decline. We don't expect to push a lot of money into the market right away, and we don't expect that we're going to be selling a lot more, assuming the market's going a lot lower. We want to be balanced. We want to have flexibility. Now, we'll see how things work out going forward. Right now, we are set up to have low volatility in the portfolios and get more information. I think it's hard to imagine that we aren't going to have more bad news as we go through this issue with COVID-19. It's a long way from over. The market won't wait till things start to get better before it starts to recover. It looks across the valley as best it can. So we're going to be watching to see, first of all, when the market does pull back, what holds up in price and what is it that sells right back off again. In a bounce like we've had in the last three days, there's a lot of short covering and there's some real buying. The first rally is not the important one. It's when the market pulls back and retests lows, the market starts to show us where the leadership is. Now, as it stands so far in the course of bear market rallies, we have had only three days. At the end of today, the market was up 14 or 15% off the low. Um, this is within the realm of what happens in bear market rallies. So as we sit today, we continue to have balanced portfolios. The team has been working very hard. We've been separated for 15 days. We talk a number of times a day on video calls and conference calls. Every position is being evaluated all day long, every day. Uh, and we're taking this job very seriously. Um, make no mistake, this sell-off will have created a generational opportunity for us to add new positions as things start to recover, for us to build out the portfolios. And we're pleased to say that the portfolios have held up far better than the market going through this decline. In fact, if we went back to September of last year, Labor Day, and took the rally into year end and the decline again, well ahead of indices. This is a business where we have to manage over the course of a cycle. We've always said it's important to make money in a good market, but just as important or more important to manage difficult markets. And we've been fortunate over time to do that. We'll continue to update you. We appreciate the, the trust that you put in us. We're happy to answer any questions that you may have. As we sit today, we own uh, some positions within the technology sector, which has held up very well. We own some positions within consumer staples, which of course have held up quite well. We own some positions within healthcare, which has held up quite well. We're focused predominantly in the US, which has had the strongest economy coming in and has had the strongest fiscal and monetary response on the other side. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to call us. Um, we look forward to speaking to you. Please stay safe and keep your family close. Thanks very much.